your payments might have to go up to six or seven thousand dollars then you have to ask yourself well i would never be able to pay that and that's why i'm saying it's a ticking time bomb this is going to explode in a lot of people's faces Over and over again, we hear about concentration of power and how that cannot be a really good thing. In a capitalist society, we need a lot of competition. Now, we need this when it's coming to having a choice of what restaurants we go to. We don't want just one restaurant in our city. We need that when it comes to banks so that there can be competition so me and you as customers can get a really good rate. This goes on and on. It doesn't matter where it even comes to a supreme ruler of a country. When that happens and there's too much concentration of power, they get a little bit hot-headed, you know, whether it's the restaurant or whether it's your dentist's office, only one in the whole city, right? We have to have a variety of different options for a variety of different people. We are all unique. But here comes the problem. With this concentration of power comes agendas. Now, we're going to be looking at a little bit something that's going on today, which is probably you don't realize how big this is when it comes to me and you. Now, look at this. Regulators urge to consider. Now, this is in Canada, but I'm going to give you a U.S. example in a second. Regulators urge to consider unrivaled bank concentration over RBC, which is Royal Bank of Canada, bid to buy another Canadian bank. Now, when we go into it, of course, they say the country's banking system is more vulnerable to the risks of climate change and slow action to address its crisis. Now, once we just jump into that, now, the first thing that they're talking about is the concentration of, and they're going to give a political agenda, whatever it is. So this channel is never about left or right. It's about what is correct down the middle of the road. But they are alluding to an issue, right, saying that the concentration of power Whatever the political agenda is of whatever that entity is, now it can actually guide public discourse and public results, not just opinion, I think, but they can sway the way the country will move forward. So let's continue to look on, though. Bank ownership that already exists in Canada poses a systemic risk to the financial system. Now, I'm going to show you this in the U.S. This is the exact same thing because when you have this concentration of power, there's a systemic risk. Now, look in Canada. It says cross-ownership refers to the bank shares owned by other banks. So in Canada, we have our large five banks, RBC, Scotiabank, TD, CIBC, and BMO. And they own 25% of each other. So already, already, you guys, number one, to have a country as big as we are and only have five major banks, I mean, that's a little cuckoo just to begin with. And now they want to take away one of them, right, and make it even less, less competition. And so that could be a problem. Just the U.S. is 10 times the size of Canada. So even if we have five and they had 10 times as many, 50 banks major banks, right? That would be a big thing, I think. But now that they collectively own each other's shares, that is even larger systemic risk as it's bringing out. Now look at here, RBC, now it breaks down. RBC owns 5% of Royal Bank, 5% of BMO, 5% of BMO Capital Markets and so forth. If we go down, it doesn't matter what bank that we want to pick. If it's Scotia Bank, they own almost 9% of Royal Bank of Canada. 5% of Bank of Montreal, like they have voting shares in how each other operate. TD, same thing, almost 9% of Royal Bank, 5% of Bank of Montreal. And so, guys, you think that BMO or whatever bank it is, they can stand on their own two feet. But when the majority shareholder is somebody else, it's a very, very small group. This is systemic risk, right? Now, the article goes on to talk about them and climate control. Now, of course, they're going to say all these banks should not be investing in any fossil fuels of any way. Put our politics about that just aside for a second. As political wills change left and right through time, Whatever that agenda is, they can forward that agenda, whatever it's going to be at whatever time. And it's too much power for a handful of banks. Imagine one WhatsApp group where they can dictate everything you do in your lives. Forget about political will. The banks are more powerful than any political party possibly. Now, let's go on and look at how inbred this is. In the United States, J.P. Morgan Chase, this is the largest bank in the United States. They bought this First Republic Bank that you guys know that collapsed not long ago. And when it collapsed, it says that they bought this bank. And how much did they pay for it? 
a whopping zero dollars, right? So now JP Morgan absorbs hundreds of billions of dollars of benefit for zero dollars outlay. So this is how capitalism works, right? Is the big continue to get bigger and squash out competition. But is that really so? Well, absolutely it is. If we even look at Statistica, you can see that just since the year 2000, there was 8,000 banks in the United States. And currently we are sitting at 4,000. And just look at that. That's a very, very, very gradual decline. 8,000 in the year 2000, 7,500 in 05. If we go forward to the great financial crisis at the end in 2010, 6,500. Keep on moving back to when COVID started and we're now at 4,300, currently sitting at 4,100. So hundreds of banks are going out of business and the bigger banks continue to get bigger. Now let's go back a little bit farther. If we go back in the United States on the FDIC website, back in 1934, Great Depression, 14,000 banks around. And as we continue on by the end of the Second World War, we're now at 13,000 banks. Continue on to maybe when I was born. I was born in 79, now 14,000 banks. Continue on. 2,000, 8,000 banks. Great financial crisis, there were 7,000 banks. Do you notice that it just gets less and less and less over time? In Canada, we are in a different boat. We have mega banks here. So they always talk about the big five because there is only five, but there is a list. And you would be shocked to know that in Canada, there's actually 30 banks, but banks, banks, schmanks. It's not the ones that we normally think of. Most, there's a lot of insurance companies in here. Bridgewater opened a bank, Canadian Tire, an appliance store. You know, they now have their own bank. Canadian Western Bank, very, very, very tiny. Tangerine doesn't even do a lot of stuff. Haventry Bank. There's a lot of banks that here that you wouldn't even know that it even actually existed. Manulife, it's an insurance company. So there's very, very few banks, but there's generally only five banks that actually operate in Canada. And so we want to talk about, well, if we go back in that concentration of power where we're talking about the Canada, the top five banks own each other, right? They're all owning each other. Very like inbred little group here. But in Canada as well, if we remember Silicon Valley Bank that went down earlier in the spring, the Canadian banks, Scotiabank, BMO, and TD, they lost $19 billion when Silicon Valley Bank went under. So again, we have to zoom out here and take a look at that. It's not just that they own each other just within Canada. It's not just that they own each other's banks around the United States. It also is that they're owning other banks like Credit Suisse in Europe. And so when one thing happens, I know the first thing that people always say to me is, whatever. Whatever happened, Switzerland, not my problem. Well, it kind of is your problem because your local bank just lost $2 billion, $5 billion when that happened. So it's not really your problem. Same thing is when I'm telling everyone that there is a mega problem coming in real estate. First to drop is going to be commercial real estate and then residential. When that happens, guess what everyone says to me? Not my problem if some rich commercial guy falls. Really? The majority of commercial real estate is sitting inside of pension funds. And though other companies like Bridgewater, let's say, but guess what? That's the stock that's in your pension fund. And if it goes down now, you're not going to have the same payouts that you had before. And this is what people don't realize is how like interconnected, like a spider web and these dominoes all fall one after the other. So I want to show you guys the two things that I am most afraid of that is coming not far into our future. These are the biggest risks that I'm seeing that is coming on. And I want to know what you guys think of it. These are the biggest risks to me and you coming up. Now, there's this term that we hear about all the time called liquidity. And what on earth is liquidity? Like, I hear about this word and everybody just goes, ah, not my problem. I don't know what it is. So they skip over it. Liquidity is simply how much money is available to you. And so this is where if we look at the world today, we need money to buy a car. We need a loan. We need a loan to buy a house. We need a loan to open our business. Yeah, sure. There's some people that buy in cash, but the majority need money, working capital to invest in stock in order to be able to sell it like stuff to put in the back. And maybe you're buying a bunch of like honey jars to sell. Everything runs on credit. So if we freeze up the loans, then we're finished. The economy dies. And so here we are right now. Liquidity. And this is the biggest danger is no more loans, which means no more mortgages. So if you want to look at today, the number of people that buy homes in cash, do you know what that percentage is? 
less than 10%, less than 10, okay, which is crazy. So imagine what is going to happen to the prices. Now, we are at a very, very weird time. In 2020 and 2021, we were in a very weird time. You cannot look to this. You're like 0% and money for everybody. They were giving cash out to everybody. But what you have to understand is the majority of time through history, 0% means no loans. We ain't giving cash to anybody. That's what you have to remember. In 2009 and 2010, I had friends of mine that owned their homes in cash, cash. And they went to the bank and said, can I have a 50% loan? No. I Well, I have cash in the bank. I have great credit. They're like, no, we don't do loans right now. Maybe in another year. Even if you have perfect cash, perfect credit, good, stable income. No, we're not doing loans. People forget about that. And if we go back in time, whenever it's 0%, it's always tight money. And everybody thinks that 2020 and 2021, well, it was 0% and loose money, willing to lend to everybody. That is an anomaly. You cannot bank on that. And so this is a big, big problem. Today in the United States, interest rates are now up to 7% again. And the onboard rate is 6.5% in Canada. But if you look at that, you guys, this is only going to be for, and I wouldn't even say it's for AAA, it's AAA plus exclamation mark highlight, because they want you to have 850 credit score and zero debt in your life to be able to qualify for 6.5. Now, I have to tell you, myself, I have always worked to maintain my credit at super high numbers, okay? I want my credit perfect. I want my loan-to-values to be amazing. I'm always working on this. And even when I contact the bank, I'm getting an offer for 9.5% right now in Canada. I have a lot of clients of mine who have 10% mortgages right now. So I know that you can see 6.5 on the news. I know that's being advertised. Well, 5.5. It's only if all the stars align, okay? That's what they advertise. But have you met anybody who's getting a 6.5 right now? That's what I want to know from you. If you're getting that, please leave a comment below. I'd love to hear about it. But the majority of people that I'm seeing have much, much higher scores, much higher rates that they're having to pay. And that is what's wiping people out. Here is my second worry, extended amortizations. Right now, we have clients who have 100-year loans. 100 year loans. And you have to tell me, David, that is ridiculous. Because I know that legally, and I'm glad that you know that the maximum that you can have is a 25 year mortgage, 25 years. So how can it, the biggest long 25 year, that's the maximum could be, how can you have a hundred year loan? I mean, that's a great question. And I keep showing this to everybody along the way. I need you to imagine this is a brick wall on this side in 2018, and this is a brick wall in 2023. And this is just assuming that you have a five-year amortization right here. You can never requalify or renew past the 25 year. That's impossible. It's illegal for you to do that. But in the middle, let's say you had a $3,000 a month payment in 2018 and you're on variable. And the payment ended up going up to $6,000 over here in 2022. And you say, listen, man, I can't afford it. I can't afford $6,000 a month. So the bank can tell you legally, guys, let's make it $3,000 a month still. But instead of you paying $6,000, that $3,000 that you still owe has got to go somewhere. We're going to tack it on to the end. We're going to keep pushing it down the road. And that's how they get to a 75 85, 100-year amortization, which sounds cuckoo, right? But it can't stay at 100 year forever. You have a very short amount of time in order to fix up your life. So imagine here in 2023, when it comes due, you now hit the brick wall again. And when it hits that brick wall, the payment's got to go back to 25 years. So your payments might have to go up to six or seven thousand dollars again for you to be able to recuperate. So then you have to ask yourself, well, I would never be able to pay that. And that's why I'm saying it's a ticking time bomb. This is going to explode in a lot of people's faces, unfortunately. Now, we don't want that to happen, but that's the reality of where we are. And so we had a lot of talks about this, even within my companies. We are having talks with a lot of clients on a regular basis, and this is coming. Whether we like it or not, we can't bury our heads in the sand. And there's a tsunami that is coming. So there was a lot of people who only had one or two year mortgages. But in 2020 and 2021, there were a lot of people that were getting three years, four years, five years. So if you bought in 2021, it's coming up in 2024. 
And so when we see that, and there's a lot of these projections available online, you can look at their portfolio maturity books at each individual bank. They can see the writing on the wall. And that is why today, today, they are at 13 times what they had in reserves before. 13 times. They're setting aside many, many billions of dollars, each bank, for all the loans that they know are going to be defaulting. So number one, we know that the defaults are going to drop a lot of home prices because people can't afford them, number one. But number two, it's a double problem, is because if they're taking all those billions aside and sticking it under their pillow for the rainy day that's coming, all those billions are not being sent out as loans so that people can continue their businesses or buy more properties. So we're in double trouble in this case. And so this is going to happen, guys. It's coming, but are you prepared for it? And so I can tell you that the people who are not prepared for it are going to have to get very bad situation dealt their way. But the people who have prepared for it are going to have some fantastic opportunities for them. So I hope that you're in the boat of having great optimism for the future because I think there's going to be some fantastic things that are going to happen. I've been preparing for it on the side for 10 years. That's why you always have to have an opportunity fund available for you when deals come. And deals don't always come, but they do if you're looking hard enough. And so there's always deals every single day in different parts of the countries. I invest in Canada and the United States, but you know, you guys have to think about that. For some reason, I want you guys to always think about, we're very happy for some reason to buy a stock. Let's say it's NVIDIA that's in the news and it's, it might be in another country. And we're fine doing that. But for some reason, the only time that you're interested in buying real estate is if it's a block down from your home or nearby. And so we kind of have to change our mindset behind this. I think the future is super bright. I'm super excited for the deals that are going to be coming for us. And I hope that you're in that boat too. Anyway, guys, if this gives you any value, please consider subscribing to the channel and I'll talk to you soon.